So I'm going to try and keep this one under 10 minutes per usual, uh, but we're going to reverse the timeline today. So when you got my nice little scene set up, we've got a door with an animation on it. It's going to play a door open animation. Boom. Let's go ahead and open up the project, get rid of the default stuff. If you've got anything open, all you need to do is add a new file. It's going to be a file called timeline extensions. Uh, you'll have to excuse me. I'm a little, a little slow on this one today. Um, yeah, call it timeline extensions. doesn't matter if it's a regular C sharp class or something you created in Unity. Get rid of all the boilerplate stuff. This is going to be a fresh, fresh class. So we're going to start off by using system.collections. We need that for the uh, coroutines. We need Unity engine. And then it's going to be a static class of all static methods that we can call from elsewhere. Uh, we're going to first off, we're going to extend, add an extension method to our playable director. This one's going to be called reverse play. Uh, it's going to take a parameter that is this unity, unity engine dot playable dot playable director timeline that is just the timeline component that you have in the editor. Um, we can that this means that you're just adding a method onto the playable director if you've never done extension methods before. The second method we're going to add is that going to be the actual coroutine that plays our animation in reverse. Um, it's going to take that timeline the timeline from the first function. Uh, it's throwing an error here because it doesn't like when you don't return anything from an enumerator or from a coroutine, so make sure to give it that compiler error. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is going to store the current play mode for the the timeline. Make sure that we have a store so we can reset at the end. Boom. So we're going to update manually while we're actually uh, running the timeline. Uh, so. I'm going to go ahead and add a few extension methods here. So these aren't strictly necessary. You can skip this part if you like. Uh, but basically what I'm doing here is making sure that I have a nice, pretty way of saying that something is approximately equal to a double. There's not a built-in way to do this. So you have to do a bunch of casting, and the casting takes line space, and it makes it not pretty code. I like my code nice and pretty. So we're going to go ahead and cast here so that we don't have to cast elsewhere. Um, and for those of you who are already thinking, but you know, you shouldn't be casting a double to a float. Well, unfortunately, timelines use doubles and Unity time uses floats. So we're going to have to make that conversion somewhere. If you are worried about accuracy, well, you can find a better way to do this, but this should get you enough to get it off the ground. Uh, anyway, so we're doing the approximate equals double to another double and double to another float. Um, this way it'll simplify our syntax when we actually need to use this later rather than calling the line that we're actually returning which is the math x math f dot, dot approximately uh casting in the double to a float and then passing in the other float so here's where we start to make the magic happen uh, as soon as i figure out how to type there we go uh, we're going to make sure it's that we are at the end of our actual timeline uh basically if we are either at the end of the beginning we want to make sure that we set it equal to the end um, otherwise, we can continue as normal um, if you want to be able to reverse from the middle of a timeline. Otherwise, set it to the end, so we're playing from the end towards the start. So set the timeline duration. Uh, and then first thing we want to do is call timeline.evaluate. This is actually a pretty important function. If you don't call timeline.evaluate, you'll never see it update in the editor. Since we set this to manual, it won't update automatically. I'm going to go ahead and add a private field uh, for the wait routine or the wait for end of frame uh, I find this is a handy way to not have to call new every frame especially since um, this is something that's gonna they could, could potentially be called multiple times per frame uh, I don't want to allocate a whole bunch of new memory so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, yield the return a frame wait after we evaluate so that we see the update and then everything else after this will happen on a per frame basis boom this is where the magic happens so first off we get the total time of the of the timeline cast it to a float again time dot time uses floats time duration or timeline duration uses doubles so we need to do some casting here so while this is greater than zero we're going to subtract time dot delta time divided by the timeline dot duration uh, this will make sure that the time we spend on here is actually the length of the timeline um, subtract that from delta time and then we set the time dot delta time to the math max of the delta time and zero obviously if this gets below zero we don't want to set the time dot time to something below zero that could have undesired effects and then of course we make sure we evaluate and then we wait for the next frame boom once all that is done we've hit the end of the time 
going to make sure that we set the time to zero, evaluate, and then reset the time up to So this next part is going to be fun. So this next part, we're going to need to add an additional file uh, because we need a way to run coroutines at any given time. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to add something called an extension object. This is kind of a fun workaround for starting a coroutine from anywhere. Basically, we're just going to have this object always exist in our scene, and it's going to follow the singleton pattern. So we're going to have a static instance of the object. Uh, we're going to have a public instance that we can get from anywhere in the code. Uh, and then we're going to have an init function. So the static void init is going to be called, uh, we're going to use a an, an attribute called runtime initialize on load to help us uh, make sure that this object exists in the scene. But basically this function is just creating a new object. We're going to call it extension object, and then we're going to add the extension object component. That's all it is. Uh, and then in the wake function, we make sure that there are no more than one of these in the scene. If there are, get rid of the extra. In the words of Voldemort, kill the spare. Boom. And that is it for this function or for this class actually. But from here in our reverse play, we're just gonna get that extension object, get the instance of it, and then we're gonna start a code routine. Boom, that's how you start a code routine from anywhere in your code. Uh, and then from there, just call reverse timeline. Now we actually need a way to run this in the editor, so go ahead and let this compile. Uh, this is me trying to figure out where you can add a script from the, the menu or from the actual object. They moved it, I can't find it. So we're just gonna add one the old fashioned way. Right click somewhere in the project. We're going to add a new project or a new script. We're going to call it uh, door behavior. This door behavior is basically just going to allow us to test our reverse logic by reversing the timeline when we hit the space bar. So get rid of all the boilerplate code, add a serialized private field uh, that just represents the timeline. I'm going to go ahead and use using the engine.playables here, simplify the syntax a little bit. So private playable director. We're just going to call it timeline because that's what it is. Set that to null initially. And then all we're going to do is going to add an update loop, private void update. And then when we hit the space bar, input dot get key space bar or key code dot space, one of those things, whatever it is. Uh, just play the timeline in reverse. So timeline dot reverse. Boom. That is all you need to do. Uh, so now that that is ready to go, we're going to go ahead, go back to Unity. Let it recompile, drag the door onto the door, the door behavior onto the door. Can't drag the door onto a door, that'd be weird. Make sure you assign the playable director in the inspector. We don't like no reference exceptions. This is set up to play automatically, so when we play, boom, the door opens, hit spacebar, boom, the door closes. Awesome, that's all there is to it. If you like that one, drop a comment on what I should do for my next one. Like and subscribe. Thank you.